Ethics are the defining issue of our time. It will determine the world that we live in and it will determine the world in the future that we leave our children. Uh, what are ethics? Aristotle defines ethics as the actual possession and exercise of good character, which are ethical habits, and it's necessary to truly understand moral principles and to properly apply them. Today I'll be talking about a framework that I would advocate that we use in order to apply ethics to the world that we live in and to the situations that we find ourselves in in our daily lives. Richard Feynman, the noted physicist, once said, if you cannot explain something in simple terms, you do not understand it. Most people are familiar with a heuristic. Top of mind ethics is a heuristic. A lot of people in this room, when you're told to sell yourself, you're familiar with the elevator pitch, the 15 seconds or 30 seconds that you have to sell yourself or an idea. Amazon, Facebook, Airbnb, Slack are all companies that were sold off of an elevator pitch. Most people are familiar with back of the envelope calculations. It's whether you do your own personal budgeting or in some cases people forecast and run businesses off back of the envelope calculations. Those are all heuristics. Top of mind ethics or tome is a heuristic that I propose for ethics. What are the elements of top of mind ethics? The first is goodwill. This is based on Immanuel Kant's deontological philosophies and principles. The first is goodwill. Is there a positive intent for the action that you want to take? Is there a positive intent for the products and services that you want to build? Second step is the categorical imperative. To me, this is the most important element. It says that it's a maxim that if what you did, the action you want to undertake, or the product or service you want to build, or the decision you want to make, if it became a universal law and it was applied to everyone, what would that world look like? The categorical imperative requires you to not just think of yourself, think of your immediate partners or the immediate stakeholders, but it requires you to think of the entire world as a stakeholder. The third step is the law of humanity. Are people being used as a means to an end or are people the intended beneficiary of the action that you wanna take? Let's use some great historical examples that we all know about. Slavery, what was the ethical framework applied to, fra to slavery? It's pretty clear, we don't need a heuristic for this one. Our ethics failed, our moral principles failed. The first step, goodwill with our heuristic. What was the positive intent for slavery? Well, there were people who believed that they had an inherent right and they were endowed by God to enslave other people in order to civilize them. That was a rationale used as goodwill. The second part, if that's true, if that became a universal law and everyone in the world had the right to enslave other people, what would the world look like? Clearly, it would not look like a world that we wanna live in. Unfortunately, until 100 years ago, that was the world that we lived in. So how do we get to this ethical lapse? I believe it's the third part of our framework that wasn't considered, and that is the law of humanity. Are people being used as a means to an end or is this action intended to benefit people? These are easy examples. Quite clearly, slavery failed that test. As a result, we are still suffering from the ethical lapses that not just one individual made, but our collective society made as a whole. The second example I'll bring up is the decision to drop the bombs on Japan at the end of World War II. This is important because uh, it brings up the issue of Richard Feynman. Uh, and when he talked about, if you can't explain something in simple terms, you don't understand it. As it turns out, Feynman was actually part of the project to build the Manhattan, part of the Manhattan Project to build the bombs that were ultimately dropped on Japan. What was his rationale for joining? His first rationale for joining, which he thought was ethical, which was the idea that if the nuclear bomb was practically possible, then that meant that it was actually inevitable. So if the United States did not get the bomb, who he considered to be on the right side of history, it would be inevitable that Germans or Japanese did. So that was his rationale for joining the project. But this leads to something that ultimately he began to realize that once Germany was defeated, Japan was encircled, the question is, was it necessary to actually drop those nuclear bombs? 
That has become the biggest question in the history of technology because nuclear weapons are the most highly reg regulated technology in the history of the world. It is the first technology that creates the existential threat with the capacity to end humanity, which is the reason why I picked it as an example. The reason why we have not dropped another nuclear bomb or another one has not been exploded is because the world collectively decided that this technology was so extreme and its power so great that we have to get together and create an ethical, a moral and regulatory regime in order to prevent the reasons to drop it again. Which brings us back to Feynman. Feynman came up with a concept called ethical drift because after the, the decision was made to drop the bomb, he actually regretted his involvement in the project. And he regretted it for a couple of reasons. The first reason is that he never revisited his original decision to join the Manhattan Project. His original rationale was because he thought that it would be inevitable that if we, who were the good guys at the time, didn't get the bomb, then the enemies would get the bomb. But once it became clear that we were winning that war and it was unnecessary to drop the nuclear bomb, he did not raise his objections. Uh, and that led to an entire movement, which many people are aware of, the Union of Concerned Scientists, uh, a lot of scientists and, and uh, physicists who will not work on military projects and who have ultimately decided that they are for nuclear nonproliferation. I bring this up because in our regular life or in our daily life, and also now that we see in the world exploding all around us in society and in the geopolitical world, you can always revisit your decisions. And we think that, and I think that is important. And I think that the top of mind ethics framework that I'm advocating today will help you. What are the big challenges that are going to happen in the future? The biggest challenge I think facing humanity will be the challenge of space exploration. The reason why I'm particularly worried about space exploration and applying our ethical framework to it is because when I hear the rationale for Elon Musk and Jeffrey Bezos for reasons why we need to go to space, which is that there will be overcapacity of, on, the, uh, on the Earth, that we are going to use resources and we need resources in space in order to prolong uh, the humanity. When I see this rationale, it reminds me a lot of the Christopher Columbus rationale for exploring the new world which is that we need to find new resources, that there's gold here, uh, that there are other forms of wealth for the European countries that can be found in the new world. And as a result, all the people that they found here ultimately became assets to that resource rationale objective. So let's apply our framework to future space. We've talked about two past examples, slavery, and we talked about uh, the decision to drop the atomic bomb on Japan. But let's talk in the future, which is what Jeffrey Bezos imagines as space cities. And Elon Musk is along with him on the idea of space exploration. Space cities, what's the rationale? The Earth is moving out of, uh, running out of resources. Our carrying capacity has been diminished. Uh, so does it pass our first test, which is goodwill? Is there a positive intent? Yes, theoretically, there's a good intent. We want to move out into space so that human beings have more opportunities to spread themselves out and so we don't create a Malthusian disaster on Earth. Uh, the second step is categorical imperative. If everyone on Earth decided that they would rather go into space exploration as opposed to stay on Earth, what would happen in the interim as people are leaving? There would be a resource situation where only people who are wealthy or who could afford to go to space would go to space first. That decreases our incentive to invest on Earth. That decreases our incentive to spread the wealth. That decreases our incentive to look after our fellow man and it decreases our incentive to look after Earth. So in my opinion, it fails the categorical imperative test. Third is the law of humanity. Are people being used as a means to an end when we go to space, or are people the primary beneficiary? Gets back to the rationale question. Why are we going? If we're going based on the old Christopher Columbus model on the resource rationale, I would say that it would fail the law of humanity test. But the goal is not to limit space exploration, or the goal is not to develop future technology. The goal is to develop it in a way that it can pass the test of goodwill, the categorical imperative, and the law of humanity. 
all over the world today, especially in the last year or the last couple of years, we've seen society hit with a lot of ethical challenges. And I propose to you that top of mind ethics or tome, goodwill, the law of humanity, uh, and the category one core imperative are three steps that we can take that will allow us to put ethics at the top of mind, which will help decide the future and make sure that it is a world that we all want to live in.